thank you so much for coming on the Awkward Conversations podcast. Uh, we like to joke that uh, the only awkward thing about the conversations is us. So uh, yeah, no, there's it's not no way. Uh, well, not, uh, not it's not like the Nolan show or anything <laughs> like that. So nothing is like the Nolan show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, first of all, I just think um, I like these kinds of conversations because it helps uh, the the listeners get to know our candidates. Because I think when you're associated with a party. You are the party, and there's nothing. There's no human. In, you can, there's nothing human behind it. When the total opposite is the truth, you know. Um, yeah. So, uh, how are you doing? I'm not too bad. I'm actually relieved to be sitting down for for this period of time <laughs> because I have been walking like a maniac for the past. I don't know how many weeks it's been now. So it just seems like forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I used to. I know this is totally not the same thing, but like I used to work going door to door in Australia. I used to, uh, I was backpacking in Australia for a bit and I went door to door in like a sales job. It was really nerve wracking going up to the door and knocking the door. How, how, do, you, how do you find that? Um, I think I'm used to it now. At the start, I was terrified of going up to the door because you didn't know whether somebody was going to tell you to do one or um, they were actually going to be nice to you. Um, yeah, it's, it's now it's not too bad. If somebody's ripping up a leaflet and throwing it in your face, um, it's it, you can sort of go, well, thank you very much, and, and run away. But um, <laughs> no, in the past, I would have been very nervous, but now it's fine. Um, you know, you, you expect if, if someone doesn't want you to be at their door, fair enough. You know, um, you just sort of say, nope, thanks very much, and, and turn and carry on about your business because the next door could be a lovely door and the one after that could be another terrible door. So ugh, it's, I find now, actually, there's more and more doors where I get in more trouble when I go to the doors because I tend to have a bit of crack with people and want to chitter and all the rest of the team are going, where's she at? So um, <laughs> I tend to get in a bit of trouble. Plus, I've been known to go into people's houses um, because they want to show me something out their back or they just want to have a blather and the team's all panicking thinking I've been lifted by somebody but I haven't been I'm just having a crack. (laughs) Is there any awkward conversations like awkward kind of questions or anything asked of you? It's more the situation Um, you don't know when you go to the door who's going to answer the door so it could be somebody's kid it could be their granny it could be them it's when they come to the door naked is the one that, that really <laughs> throws you completely and sometimes they're the people that want to ask you questions so I remember um <laughs> you know it's not oh I'm blushing because I'm naked no not at all um tops off and this sort of lovely weather is is a normal thing but tops off when it's a woman coming to the door that's very little else on it's <laughs> okay um I remember one famous night that um, one of the people I work with went to a door and thank goodness it was a stable door so the top part opened inwards to a fully naked man um, who wanted to ask lots of questions about what we were doing about certain things. And um, thank goodness the bottom of the door didn't open. (laughs) Yeah, we've had it um, in a rural area where I don't know whether somebody was expecting somebody else to be knocking the door um, for a door curtain to be used to cover their blushes. But um, yeah, it's it's, um, it's interesting. (laughs) Um, the questions on the doors are always sort of similar things. You know, people are asking, you know, what he's going to do about X, Y, and Z. This time he's going into government, but um, no, it's usually the situations. You'll find somebody up to their oxters and gardening, and they don't want to speak to you because they're too busy trying to pull a plant out or do something. And and when you try to give them a hand, that can be a bit of messy. Um, people <laughs> usually in the middle of bath and kids, or just about to take a kid to bed. Um, I hate when that happens because I haven't been there myself. Um, anybody disturbing the nighttime routine uh, gets a bad look in my in my eyes but no it's it's the nakedness on the doors and how frequently it happens is a bit scary <laughs> maybe we're like a secret society of nudists and we just don't know it's just not talked about like <laughs> mm, yeah and the cold of winter but mm. <laughs> <laughs> like that 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 is a certain level of confidence particularly for the males that is it's not a confidence i share so I, that's not <laughs> yeah now, when we go around early in the mornings, I have to say that there's quite a lot of people in their jammies and, you know, big, no big deal, but it's the budgie smugglers that, that come to the door. <laughs> yeah. sort of go, didn't need to say that, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, um, have you ever seen that show, Naked Attraction? I actually avoid it like the plague because I just have that old, when I was sitting in the living room with my parents when I was a kid, you know, you can't look at anything sexy on the TV. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I haven't, I know what it's about, but I haven't seen it. But yeah, that's basically what happens on the doors. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that is, that show like boggles my mind. It cracks me up. Like, like I'm a teacher and like, 
you bring it up in the staff room and there's kind of that awkward sense of everyone knows it has probably seen about 20 minutes of it at least and no one wants to admit it and I remember one day like one of the teachers said oh you know it is absolutely disgraceful in one episode she was talking about this and then she was talking about someone else in another episode I was like hang on you're outraged how many episodes did you watch you know (laughs) Yeah, no, it's not my cup of tea at all. But um, no, I still have that sort of cringe, um, you know, if anybody started um, even kissing goodness in the 1970s, I'd be crawling away going, my dad's looking at me and he's seeing me see him on the TV. Yeah. You know, you could be sitting in your room all night and you decide for 10 minutes to join your parents or whatever to watch TV. And then that'll be the time there'll be like a full on sex scene on the TV. Like either that or david attenborough has animals and they've decided that that's the one part of the program yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> usually it used to be when my mother and father-in-law were around um yeah very embarrassing <laughs> um how many people out of curiosity were to guess do you think you've not in this election cycle um i can nearly tell you word for word now because we've got this new hateful app oh, that oh. records everything that we do so so far um it's eight and a half thousand doors um it's a lot of knuckles being rubbed up against pieces of plastic and pieces of wood but um the last election um, me and david ford had a competition to see now outside of newton or, or outside of sorry um, big built up areas like belfast um to get close to ten thousand doors is amazing and david ford and i were having a race on this so in south Andrew, i think or you'll correct me anyway i think he'd knocked about nine thousand doors and i got nine thousand two hundred the last time so I beat him. I beat him. The master, the master at canvassing. I actually beat him. But um, I have to say, this time there's been a, because the good weather has kicked in recently. There's a lot of people not home, so uh, I'm sure that I will get complaints from people saying you put your letter through or you put your leaflet through the door, but you didn't speak to me. Uh, you weren't home. Um, yeah. But, yeah, but we do knock an awful lot of doors. I actually think Royal Mail should contract MLAs to deliver their post when we're going out because yeah. we're sort of double up on postmen. You see them sort of going, hmm, I've just delivered yeah. a load of leaflets for you and there you are in the street. You could have done that yourself. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, save time on that one. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah the, uh, out of curiosity, so you've about eight, eight or so thousand. Um, how many times has the protocol been brought up with you? Honestly, yeah. twice. Out, twice. Of eight, out of 8,000. Out of 8,000, um, there was a guy, I can nearly take you to their doors and tell you, there was one teacher um, who brought it up in Newton Ards, and then there was another guy brought it up to me um, last Saturday in Saintfield, and that has been the only time. And the one in Saintfield on Saturday said, if you tried to talk to me about the protocol this door, I'm going to chase you down my path. But the teacher was, how is, how is this impacting? But honestly, twice. The most things is the normal stuff that people want to talk about is how much oil and gas, especially oil in, in the rural areas, how much mm. it's costing them, how much petrol and diesel's costing to run their cars. A lot of them were getting very annoyed about this, the Unite Union strikes coming up because they were going to have to find childcare and childcare is expensive enough. Um, a lot of people talking about um, just waiting lists, health, the usual stuff. So protocol, I've, I haven't found it coming up. And to be honest, our team, we drilled everybody and told them, you know, if somebody's talking about the protocol, this is what it means and this is what's happening and this is the current stuff. Yeah. Apart from me, I think of the rest of the team, I think one or two of them have had one people, one person speaking. So it's it hasn't been a big thing on the doors. It's crazy how much airtime it's getting for something that, like, it seems objectively is not an issue for voters. No, for, really for, for the, like, a, that's not fair. It is an issue for some voters, I should say. Um, but it's like, if you look at the, I guess, the percentage of the voters, like even like I'm a lot of like unionist friends, I'll be from nationalist background, but a lot of unionist friends and like none of them are, none, none of them are losing sleep. In fact, some of them are telling me the benefits of it as a result of, you know, their industries that they work in. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. It's about um, those that, that are benefiting. So manufacturing ni has said very clearly you know that um the benefits of it have been outweighing the bad parts of it um but do you know what see and it would be the same of me if i wasn't a politician somebody coming to your door it's what is affecting you today what's what's the things that are really impacting in your life and if you've just bought a tank of oil or half a tank of oil you're going to have a heart attack over the price because it's quite expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if you've just done your groceries and you found that you couldn't get the types of grocery that you're looking for, well, that might have something to do with protocol, but at the same time, 
it's seasonal, you know, depends on what vegetables and stuff are available. But you see that whole childcare thing. Um, I would have a lot of parents would talk to me about childcare. Um, thank goodness I don't have to pay it anymore because mine's is old enough. But that's killing people. Um, yeah. And, you know, the childminders are trying their best. And in rural areas, you tend to tend to find a lot of childminders as opposed to creches or nurseries. Um, and the childminders are trying their best, but they've had to put up their prices because their costs have gone up. Um, and there are fewer of them as well. So it's a bit of a market at the moment. But that's the sort of stuff that people are talking about, you know. Uh, yeah, terrible. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, your own experience uh, of using the, the NHS, um, uh, if you don't mind me asking about your, um, I remember you are talking or reading, talking about before with uh, you, you, is it, am I right in saying you've got 40% hearing? Yeah, well, I've lost 40% of or my lo hearing. Lost 40%, yeah. sorry. So um, the, all high pitched and low sound and noises are gone. So I'm a double hearing aid wearer. Um, thank goodness for my bionic ears um <laughs> but i have to say i gave up with nhs um because i had been waiting forever and i was finding that i just was missing out too much uh, i'd already started to work in the assembly and my hearing was appalling and i went and got a test done and yep it was discovered yep you should have had hearing aids a long time ago and i just went and, and bought them myself um I have since been through the NHS again um, for hearing tests. Eventually, I got up to the top of the list and had a hearing test done. But because I had bought hearing aids, um, I'd said to the NHS doctors, I said, they were going to give me hearing aids that day. And I said, I'm not going to use um, something that, you know, because I have already got hearing aids. So what they did then is they took me off the system, the NHS system completely. So I will need to go back and I will need to get hearing tests done. But because I didn't take the NHS hearing aids, um, I'm off their system and I have to start all over again, another four years waiting. But um, it's a bit frustrating that way, um, just for something as simple as getting hearing aids. And as soon as I was in the system, it was like almost immediate. You know, you do have a lot of hearing loss. Um, the only way that you can maintain, you know, a level of hearing that you can still work with and, and get communications from other people is to have hearing aids. Um, they were going to sort it out there and then, but unfortunately, very strange system. So we have hearing, it's a bit like opticians. So if you imagine you go to, you think, right, my eyes are a bit blurry here. I can't drive at night without seeing a bit of you know, stripes coming off lights. I'll go and get my eyes tested. So you can go to somewhere in the high street and you can get your eyes tested and you can go and buy glasses. Hearing's a bit different um, because you could go into the Specsavers or any of those other companies are available, um, Hearing Direct, and you can get your hearing tested and you can go and buy it. But if you want to go through NHS, you have to go to your GP for your GP to refer you to a hospital to get then get a hearing test done. I don't know why you just can't go automatically to the hospital to try yeah. and get an appointment because you're tying up GP time, yeah. asking them for something. And it's down in my records that I'm partial hearing. So why do I need to go back to the GP to ask them again to arrange for me to go to the hospital? So I think there's an awful lot of wastage goes on in the NHS. There's an awful lot of things that we involve GPs in just to get their tick box done. And maybe this, um, I know the telephone triage system, um, a lot of people don't like it. I actually think for something like that, where I just need a referral to the hospital for another hearing test would actually be a lot easier. There's yeah. some of the things I think we could just streamline so much better and take a lot of that waiting time out of the system. Because it seems to be once you've got through all that waiting and you get to see a consultant, things happen very qu quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's almost comical, like, you know, uh, fastest finger first, phone in the GP, you know, uh, you just sitting with your finger on the phone, tapping away. Redial, like, redial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when you get through, they go, we have no more appointments left today. Phone back <laughs> tomorrow morning at half eight. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I could imagine that that's maybe uh, people end up in a and &E as a result of, 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 you know, just constantly missing out and then problems being bigger, you know, so yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, or people are going to a and &E. It, and I have to say, when I, the last time I spoke to the chief executive of one of the local trusts, um, they said that they were very mindful that people going through the doors of a &E were there was an impression being given that they were in the wrong place, that they should have been with their GP or something like that. But she was saying the majority of people who are going to a &E now are those people who genuinely cannot get to a GP and have no choice but to go to a &E. Um, But I do remember a friend of mine who worked in a &E, um got very angry one evening when a lady turned up tea towels all wrapped around her hands really really sore hand oh holding it up 
And when he took it all off, what had happened was she'd shut the door on her false fingernail and it had tugged on her nail harder and made it bleed Ooh. a little bit, which is sore, but it's not an emergency that needs an ambulance. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, so that I think we have to respect our A and E's as well. Um, for instance, we have uh, minor injuries clinic in Newton Arts. Fantastic! You can waltz in there any time, and the place is sitting half empty. Oh. Um, and you can get X-rays done, and you can get lots of stuff done, and you don't need to go anywhere near A and E. The last place I think I would ever want to be in this planet is A and E on a Friday or Saturday night. Oh Good grief! God, yeah. yeah, it's awful. Um, awful for the staff, awful for people waiting, and to be honest, some of the patients in it are just oh, it's awful. And you see the ambulances piled up as well. So we need to do something about our A and E. And I know pharmacists are doing a bit more now, but um. Yeah, those those minor injuries units are a godsend, and I think more people should use those. I know it was like it was quite funny. Well, I, I probably shouldn't be laughing at it, but it was like uh, it was Halloween one year, and uh, it was outside uh, where Dempsey's used to be in the Dublin Road, and there was these two guys got in a fight, and one guy was dressed as a banana, and another guy was dressed as a chicken, and they were beating the pan out of each other. <laughs> And they both ended up having to get treated for, like, it wasn't anything too serious, but they were both taken away and, you know, they were trying to get get the suits off to get them checked over and all. And it's just like the stuff hilarious. those guys see in a and on a Saturday night must be. I know, I, I, it would be one of those ones where what comes next, you know, it's it's it must be incredibly, incredibly pressurised and the number of people coming through the doors but some of that on a Friday or Saturday. And you can see even the cops that are standing A&E. Oh, yeah. It's just like, right, okay, what has happened here? Have we just turned into a society that has just lost its whole ability to be normal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Um, yeah, the... Uh... It's interesting. I'm, I'm, I've been following. Obviously, uh, I'm sure you saw um, Jim Allister this morning, or maybe you heard anyway about uh, Jim Allister this morning um, talking about. You guessed it, <laughs> the protocol. It's like, uh, yeah, it, it, there seemed slightly concerning, uh, for want of a better word, hysteria over the protocol. You know, it seems to be, you know, uh, like, and they're on Twitter. I follow all the, you know, the people who post about it and they're saying, you know, thousands were out tonight. And then you look at the picture and it's like, yeah, there's probably about 200 people in that picture. You know, it's like thousands, you yeah. know. Yeah. Do you know what? It's, we're in the run up to an election and bad news sells stories, you know, yeah. and it, it does feel a bit like that because like I say, we have knocked eight and a half thousand doors. And my fingers certainly know about it, but I'm not hearing it. And, and it's not as if I don't knock unionists or loyalist stores because we do. And, you know, especially, you know, families are asking for, you know, do better for us. You know, it's it's not throw the whole house down and, and throw the toys out of the pram and walk away and don't dare work again. It's a lot of them are saying, just get your fingers out and get on with it and, and work hard, work harder. Um, what are you going to do for me? What are you going to do for my family? Um, and that's the sort of stuff that's, that's important. The protocol stuff, yes, it's annoying um, because it, it has an impact and it has an impact for people maybe who want a certain brand of something. I know it's having an impact on me at the minute because I'm waiting for an alternator for my stupid car and it's going to take a couple of weeks to come here. Uh, so it's a, bit, it's a bit frustrating, but it's not the end of the world. I still would rather my dad, who's a bad heart, you know, he gets to see his consultant on a regular basis so it doesn't end up 10 times worse. Um, you know, that's more important to me. You know, the protocol, I know people give off and say, well, sure, there's Alliance wanted the protocol. The protocol has built into it a reform mechanism. Um, and that reform mechanism is what needs to happen. It's happened recently there with medicines. And it's happening about, um, you know, pets being transported other than um, assistance dogs, guide dogs and so on. Um, so there are things that are being worked on. I think Jim is just, he's got, he's got a, a bee in his bonnet and this is what he thinks is his unique selling point for the election I believe um he's been going on about it now for a while he won like they got Brexit um they got what the, the government had negotiated with the EU which was the protocol um and now it's coming back to bite it's not biting I think as hard as as they say but you know I, it's one of those things that's not relevant at the moment for everybody it's a concern I think in the back of people's minds, but the ultimate aim at this moment in time is um, let's get our, our houses heated and let's get decent food in our shelves. 
you know like he's, so, he's such a highly intelligent guy and such a capable guy um yeah. i remember um he's actually quite kind as well um Jim sits behind us in the naughty corner and, um, you know, you can have a bit of crack with Jim. Once he goes into full politician mode, yeah. you could merrily thump him. But um, yeah. no, he is, he is quite a quite a kind and gentle, as you say, very intelligent man. You know, if Jim's talking about legislation, there's very little time that you can actually fault what he says because he knows what he's talking about. Um, yeah. Unlike many others in the assembly, um, <laughs> he has done his homework. He does read legislation. Um, but sitting in front of him at times you'll maybe see me going what is he saying now um because <laughs> some of his stuff is just out there we definitely don't agree politically on some stuff um uh, but no he can be quite kind um i just hope that the people that he's pushing out to to be quite aggressive and angry about all of this that they're not left with that anger and not knowing what to do with it and then yeah. hope, you know that doesn't boil over into something terrible yeah yeah i think um i doug doug Beatty kind of echoed those those sentiments there recently and i think it was fairly pragmatic you know stance to to take a step back from it um i'm actually interviewing jeffrey donaldson on friday so i'll i'll, I'll raise this with him and see see what he says yeah i'm sure he'll have a completely different take on the protocol than i will but um yeah i i just i worry for some of those young people and not so young people, to be honest, here who are going out to those few hundred that attend those rallies. Um, it's very scary for the people who are in the towns of those rallies, because not all of them are actually out the doors at the rallies. And um, I just wonder what they're trying to lead to. Yeah, um, like S Sammy Wilson's kind of been one of those uh, rogue DEP members who's kind of they think the leadership sometimes struggle to to control them because he's just not not someone who can be controlled and uh, it's interesting I, I kind of thought he would have been um, I kind of thought you know he would have maybe jumped ship to TV by now but maybe that'll be in his future. I know I, I no I don't think so I think um, TV is too much for Sammy. Um... Sammy's, Sammy's quite senior in the DUP. I can't see him jumping to another party. Um, and, uh, he's not really ready, I don't think, at this stage to retire. But, yeah, he's he's um, an interesting character. I don't know whether the DUP know whether they're punched or bored with Sammy because he tends to go on solo runs quite often. But, yeah, um, yeah I thought at one stage he would have been their leadership material, but it hasn't seemed to have come forward for him that way. Yeah, yeah. Um... I, and sometimes that's the, the, the problem when someone's been in an organization, whatever the organization is for a long time, and maybe haven't gone to the leadership position they wanted, that can be quite challenging to, to, yeah, to manage in that, in that organization. Yeah. I think a lot of people just know when to retire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched David Ford. There's not too many politicians who can come out of politics after being in it for so many years and actually be respected by so many people from no matter what party, you know, he did it right. He he waited um, till he was at retirement age and then he just went, right, that's it. It's time for me to go. And do you know what? He's having far too much fun now, which I'm very jealous about. <laughs> um, yeah, the other thing I, I wanted to ask you about, and again, only if you're you're comfortable talking about it, is um, what, uh, really an extraordinary um, level of, I, I don't even know what the right uh, adjectives would be, maybe tragedy and, and uh, adversity um in in terms of the amount of miscarriages you've had and then the miracle uh that is your daughter now you know um yeah. are, you, are you comfortable talking a bit about that i am i wouldn't have been at the time but um i was a bereavement counselor for a while for um remember our child locally here in northern ireland it was sort of like an unofficial get together of of parents who'd been through miscarriage um and i have to say thank goodness for them um, there was a lady, Lavinia, who ran the group um, after my first miscarriage. She certainly helped me quite a bit. It wasn't physically that I was in such a mess, but um, emotionally, I hadn't known anybody else who'd been through it and and struggled probably with what now looking back was post-traumatic stress. Um, yeah, it was horrendous. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, of my 14 possibilities um my one and only my seventh my Sophia um is the one that survived now I had miscarriages I had failed IVF um I had quite a lot of um fertility difficulties but the miscarriages themselves I have to say took it took it out of us quite so much as I say six before Sophia and then 
another seven after her. Um, it, it wasn't the easiest um, for us. Um, it was certainly one of those times in my life where it was keep going um, if we want to have a family. Um, but it, it was soul destroying. Um, every time I got pregnant, it was let's go for another scan and, you know, be prepared for the worst to happen. Either it has already happened or it's about to happen. Um, the last one I had was only 42. Um, I'm sort of glad it was the last one because I don't know how many more times I could have put up with it. But um, it got to the stage where you go for the scan and you were almost consoling the person giving you the scan because they had to give you bad news. And to me, it was it was another piece of bad news. Um, I remember actually going to the scan when we were having Sophia and there was a heartbeat there and I nearly leapt off the table and, and they were sort of going, but you calm yourself down because you're getting an internal scan. And um, I was <laughs> in cotton wool the whole, I actually fell like a dose on my knees, hands and knees when it was about eight and a half weeks pregnant. And I thought, this is, I've done it now. I've, uh, after all this time waiting for this, I've, I've wrecked it, but thankfully she stayed where she was. Um, it's one of those things, sadly, that you don't know why it happens um you blame yourself completely what did, what did I do wrong did I twist the wrong way in the car putting the seat belt on did I do too much exercise did I not eat something right um and it's horrendous and it's one of those very taboo um grief that not a lot of people may know that you've been pregnant um because mine's all happened fairly early on um but through the remember our child um and cruise bereavement services I got to know some amazing women who had been through the crying times like me and through the times when you hate at the television because every other advert was about baby formula or nappies um, or just, you know, families that weren't having a great time and you were jealous because they had children and you didn't. And just that horrendous period that you go through. Um, I was very fortunate that my other half stuck with me and I stuck with him. Um, many marriages and many partnerships break up over something like that, but we kept with it. And then, of course, we had our Sevilla. That that changed the world because Little Miss Princess came along. Um, but yeah, it it was it was horrendous. Um, very lonely time. Um, very a very long time to be honest, because it started um, probably when I was twenty five. Yeah, twenty five, coming twenty six, and finally ended when I was forty two. So it's a significant period of your life when you just get worried about it happening over and over again. But I think the worst thing that, that happened out of it, not just the losses, um, and they're ingrained in my mind all the time, um, has been how some people react when you do tell them. And I, I tell people because I know that there'll be a mummy or a daddy sitting out there who's in bits and they just need to know that they're not on their own. What they're feeling is not unusual, you know, to, to not sleep at night and sleep all day or hate seeing teenagers with babies and prams and and... Oh, just that desperate need to have your own baby and the aching arms, there's an aching arms, it's actually called aching arms um, group that, that deal with people and that trauma that people go through um, and even nurses and midwives and, and the people that treat you in the hospital, the trauma that they go through, we try to help them as well. But what hurt me the most was um, being called a baby killer um, that if I had been um, stronger, I wouldn't have been so selfish to try to keep on getting pregnant um, and to have a family and to stop killing all these babies because I knew rightly that I was always going to miscarry. Um, and that that hurt me quite a bit. Um, and it's something that I find very difficult whenever people talk about pregnancy and pregnancy loss or you know, whether somebody wants to have a pregnancy or not. Um, there are those of us who've been through hell on earth, including medical abortions, um, because I had to have my last removed with a medical abortion because um, the remains hadn't come away. And the the hate that we receive is, is quite, quite difficult. Um, I don't know, maybe it's the way I cope with it. I just keep on talking about it because I think I learned for years bottling up your grief and bottling up your pain um, just makes it harder. Um, so now I'm quite open about it. Um, it's not something I'm jumping for joy over. There's I've just gone through um, two anniversaries at the start of April. Um, and you always sort of think what would have been, you know, how old that, that child would have been and what they could have been doing. Um, it, it, it's always with you, but... For those people who are really callous about it, um, that's, I find that quite difficult. Um, 
it's really tough and it makes it very tough whenever you're trying to to fight for better for people who've miscarried thank goodness in the last mandate um we did actually manage to do something in politics to help people so we had miscarriage um, recognized in the same way that stillbirth is recognized and um anybody who for, i think it's from 2024 who goes through a miscarriage will be allowed time off work i went through miscarriages while i was at work um and sometimes you just carried on working um sometimes you had to stay at home because you weren't very well afterwards other times maybe you had to go to hospital and, and you weren't that well so you took time off in the sick um but there was never any allocation or awareness or alliance really for you had to take time off because you'd had a miscarriage and that was another dig in the teeth because your child was never recognized or acknowledged so we managed to get the miscarriage um and built into the parental um bereavement sadly leave and pay um which was something that I'm, i was delighted to to get through and i did tell my story during that um debate several times unfortunately but um there's other things that i would love to see happening which is something like a miscarriage register so that if you've been through it now if you go if you've been through it and you go to your doctor and you've had a pro positive pregnancy test and then it's negative it will be down as a miscarriage but nobody records that anywhere and um, you don't get a death certificate so i would love to see a register where miscarriages are recognized because for once then those parents will have um somewhere where it's been recognized that that they had a child um it's very tough that's extraordinary like they can also you know, extraordinary that, uh, you know, the, the idea that you have to go back, well, you had to go back to work, you know, uh, or the idea is the expectation or whatever is that you go back to work because there's no, well, there was no built in mechanism for it. That's... If you, if, if, say, for instance, you um, had lost a baby in pregnancy at, at 24, 25 weeks, you can take time off. It, it, it's seen very much as, you know, you have lost in pregnancy, but any time before 24 weeks, so it could be 23 weeks and six days, um, it's a miscarriage and that's just something where you don't have anything there um, and you're just expected, but both parents are expected just to carry on. Um, it, it was interesting what, what you're talking about, you know, how uh, a lot of marriages can, like sadly, split up as a result of the tragedy. Um, as someone who's largely ignorant of it, um, what's the di or, uh, 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 that's if you know, but it, what's the dynamic behind that, or what? Why do couples split up as a result of, um, like kind of that kind of tragedy? And, and I actually know of a couple that have, and it was as a result of that. I just, I'm not quite un uh, ignorant of the dynamic there. Well, men and women, they're both grave, but um, quite often it can be very different. So a, a woman will want to talk about it. Um, She'll need to be reassured. Um, she'll need to um, sort of understand exactly why this has happened. Um, a lot of men who I've spoken to have been through it are just, well, they feel guilty because they don't have that pain, you know, the physical pain that's, that is happening within the woman's body, but then they become quite technical. So what they'll want to do is protect their partner, um, be the, the person that makes the dinner and you know, gets the house sorted out and makes sure that work is there and things are paid for. And, and it's just different ways, whereas the woman just wants him to sit down and talk to her and talk about it and keep talking about it. And quite often it just gets to that point where you don't have any answers to it and it just tears people apart. And um, the other thing then would be if you already have children or you want to have children, um, it's how quickly then that you try again um, and for one side of the partnership, it may well be if she gets pregnant again and this happens again, this is terrifying. She could be thinking the same thing. Um, but it's 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 just it becomes so incredibly tense and pressurized that some people just can't go through it. It's just so hard. Um, and it's really sad to see that happening because they're they're both the parents, whether they're married or not, they're both the parents who are suffering. Um, and it this is the big thing. They do need to understand and be able to talk. As much as they need to talk to be able to get through it um, you wouldn't expect somebody who has lost a child or a mother or a father or a grandparent to never mention them again or never think about them again or anything like that so to lose a child in pregnancy just because you didn't get the opportunity to hold that child um 
everything that you wanted and thought about what they were going to be or who they were going to be doesn't disappear. And that that quite often is very hard for the parents because they can't turn around to, you know, their mates and say, oh, there's your wee ones just turned three. Mine would have been three next week um, because people don't want to talk about death. Um, and it's just sad that that type of communication can't happen. And unfortunately, it just does lead to, lead to break up of, of some relationships. Um, but it can also lead to break up within families because um, you could have um, a couple or a person who's, who's suffered through a miscarriage and their family never knew about it and they can't explain it to them why they can't cope with the, the, the new niece or the new nephew's birthdays or, you know, why they're not getting pregnant or maybe the, the mother and father-in-law are mad keen to have their first grandchild and, and, you know, they're not producing it for them and what's going on. So it's, it's a lot of pressure and it tends to happen for people, you know, who are in new relationships, settled down at a time when maybe they've just got married or, you know, they're under the pressure of getting a house and all that sort of stuff. So it's just this keg of emotions. So it's really sad, actually. But we, I find that um, that space to just hear other people talking about it and for as long as the person needs to, they might only had to go to one you know, sort of like a group meeting on it um, and it would be enough. Or they would go for maybe six months and that might be enough. Um, yeah. Some of us went far too long. We've got friends and, and went for three years, um, but we ended up being then bereavement counsellors out of it to try and help others. I remember I used to do the the 24 hour line and um, I would have my phone available at night for anybody that wanted to phone through just in those wee dark hours. And I remember I used to get a regular phone call about half five in the morning from someone who just wanted to know if I was okay because it was something that they got to you know are you okay yep and then put the phone down go back to sleep um and it was just something to keep their heads on their shoulders at that stage but it's a tough time for people physically and mentally especially mentally it's very hard so you became a braving counselor was that was there ever times when that was a bit close to home when people were sharing their stories with you to the point where you were you felt like negatively affected by it just because of it was maybe bringing up painful memories for you or no the way that it worked was um it was only when you got to the stage when you could actually speak and cope with it yourself that you would go down that road because what you don't want to do is the person who's calling you for help um is put into a situation where you're crying on their shoulder and uh-huh. um, we also had a rule that if if the bereavement counselor themselves was pregnant um that they wouldn't continue to do uh-huh. the sort of phone calls in the meetings because um you always have that thing running through your head that this could happen again to you. Um, So we were very careful with people who were the counsellors to make sure that they were supported. Um, We attended proper training and everything. I remember having to go down to Dublin to to be trained. Um, And there was always, you know, that sort of feed into the the wider group, you know, how are you doing or how are you coping with someone? Um, And to be honest, I felt very isolated and alone when it happened to me. I didn't I never wanted that to be for someone else um and even just me shutting up and listen letting somebody say what they needed to say no matter how weird and wonderful it was um if that could get them out of their depths of depression um and their grief I remember actually I had a wonderful GP after my first and um I went to him eventually I was very very low mentally very low and um we discussed sort of what I had planned to do and all this sort of stuff and he really looked after me but it was because he listened and I always remember um, whenever I was doing the counselling the key thing that you can do is shut your mouth and listen to the person because they're not being listened to by many other people because nobody else wants to hear it nobody else wants to have to deal with it um you know we say sorry for your loss when somebody is bereaved but when it's a baby when it's a, a, especially in pregnancy nobody knows what to say to the person and even saying to someone I'm sorry for your loss had you named your baby oh that that that's just amazing because it means then that you've acknowledged that the person has had a loss see that's interesting yeah a couple of very close friends of mine have, have had miscarriages and uh yeah that, what you're describing is exactly how I was feeling at that time of like not knowing the right questions to ask, but hopefully, hopefully being an okay friend to check in on them once it's like, how are you doing? And, you know, uh, what, what have you been up to and that kind of thing? But yeah, that, that, that is very interesting that you saying that because that rings, rings very true. 
Um, yeah, uh, just uh, jumping on because you've been extremely generous with your time and I'm conscious you have to go soon. So I'm just going to, uh, it's just a kind of a final kind of question for you. Um, just to, before I forget, thank you for sharing that because I'm, um, yeah, I feel like that's something that is experienced by a lot of people from the sounds of it and is something like a really important thing to share. So genuinely, thank you. That, that was uh, yeah, really interesting and yeah quite inspiring that like that that you kind of use that as a catalyst to go and become kind of a breathing counselor or you felt like it was something like a really important thing to do um yeah so just in the final run-up then um what do you think your final message is in the in the next you know well, well, how many days you probably know better than i do oh, i don't know today i'm on the spot here 26 know, 20, <laughs> yeah. oh, what's that it means it's about nine days eight nine days, days yeah good grief um do you know what? I always say to people, they're going to vote whatever way they're going to vote. I'm not going to change their minds too much. <laughs> it's Northern Ireland after all. But yeah. um, do you know what? <laughs> I've, I've had the privilege of the last six years, even though three of them, yes, I know the assembly was down, but I had my constituency office was still going at that stage. Thank goodness. Um, but do you know what? David Ford was right. He told me um, whenever he was talking me into running for being an MLA. He said to me, you enjoy helping people now through your community transport work. You can help more people when you become an MLA. So to be honest, all I want to do is continue that work. Um, yeah. A lot of it's very hidden. A lot of it's behind the scenes. A lot of it's to do with benefits and housing and helping people who are in trouble locally. Um, and that's the sort of stuff that I want to keep on doing. Um, and if I'm lucky enough to be elected again, um, I can't wait to keep going. Um, yeah, th thank you so much for taking uh, the time to talk to us. And yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. No problem. Thank you very much.